Chapter Thirteen of The Guest of Quesnay by Booth Tarkington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Thirteen. The round moon was white and at its smallest high overhead when i stepped out of the phaeton in which miss elizabeth sent me back to madame rosard's midnight was twanging from a rusty old clock indoors as i crossed the fragrant courtyard to my pavilion but a lamp still burned in the salon of the grand suite a light to my mind more suggestive of the patient watcher than of the scholar at his tongue when my own lamp was extinguished i set my door ajar moved my bed out from the wall to catch whatever breeze might stir compose myself for the night as it used to be written and lay looking out upon the quiet garden where a thin white haze was rising if in taking this coin of vantage i had any subtler purpose than to seek a draught against the warmth of the night it did not fail of its reward for just as i had begun to drowse the gallery steps creaked as if beneath some immoderate weight and the noble form of Keredec emerged upon my field of vision. From the absence of a sound of footsteps, I supposed him to be either barefooted or in his stockings. His visible costume consisted of a sleeping jacket tucked into a pair of trousers, while his tousled hair and beard and generally tossed and rumpled look were those of a man who had been lying down temporarily. I heard him sigh, like one sighing for sleep as he went noiselessly across the garden and out through the archway to the road at that i sat straight up in bed to stare and well i might for here was a miracle he had lifted his arms above his head to stretch himself comfortably and he walked upright and at ease whereas when i had last seen him the night before he had been able to do little more than crawl bent far over and leaning painfully upon his friend never man beheld a more astonishing recovery from a bad case of rheumatism after a long look down the road he retraced his steps and the moonlight striking across his great forehead as he came revealed the furrows ploughed there by an anxiety of which i guessed the cause the creaking of the wooden stairs and gallery and the whine of an old door announced that he had returned to his vigil i had perhaps a quarter of an hour to consider this performance when it was repeated now however he only glanced out into the road retreating hastily and i saw that he was smiling while the speed he maintained in returning to his quarters was remarkable for one so newly convalescent the next moment saffron came through the archway ascended the steps in turn but slowly and carefully as if fearful of waking his guardian and i heard his door closing very gently long before his arrival however i had been certain of his identity with the figure i had seen gazing up at the terraces of quesnay from the borders of the grove other questions remained to bother me why had keredec not prevented this night roving and why since he did permit it should he conceal his knowledge of it from oliver and what oh what wondrous specific had the mighty man found for his disease morning failed to clarify these mysteries it brought however something rare and rich and strange i allude to the manner of amadis approach the aged gossip demoniac had to recognize the fact that he could not keep out of my way for ever there was nothing for it but to put as good a face as possible upon a bad business and get it over and the face he selected was a marvel not less and in no hasty sense of the word it appeared at my door to announce that breakfast waited outside primarily it displayed an expression of serenity masterly in its assumption that not the least remotest dreamiest shadow of danger could possibly be conceived by the most immoderately pessimistic and sinister imagination as even vaguely threatening and for the rest you have seen a happy young mother teaching first steps to the first-born that was amadie radiantly tender aggressively solicitous diffusing ineffable sweetness on the air wreathed in seraphic smiles 
beaming caressingly and aglow with the sacred joy that i should be looking so well he greeted me in a voice of honey and bowed me to my repast with an unconcealed fondness at once maternal and reverential i did not attempt to speak i came out silently uncannily fascinated my eyes fixed upon him while he moved gently backward cooing pleasant words about the coffee but just perceptibly keeping himself out of arm's reach until i had taken my seat when i had done that he leaned over the table and began to set useless things nearer my plate with frankly affectionate care it chanced that in making a long arm to reach something i did want my hand of which the fingers happened to be closed passed rather impatiently beneath his nose the madonna expression changed instantly to one of horror he uttered a startled croak and took a surprisingly long skip backward landing in the screen of honeysuckle vines which he seemed to imagine were some new form of hostility attacking him treacherously from the rear they sagged but did not break from their fastenings and his behaviour as he lay thus entangled would have contrasted unfavourably in dignity with the actions of a panic-stricken hen in a hammock and so conscience does make cowards of us all i said with no hope of being understood recovering some measure of mental equilibrium at the same time that he managed to find his feet he burst into shrill laughter to which he tried in vain to impart a ring of debonair carelessness eh i stumble he cried with hollow merriment i fall about and faint with fatigue pa but it is nothing truly fatigue i turned a bitter sneer upon him fatigue and you just out of bed his fat hands went up palm outward his heroic laughter was checked as with a sob an expression of tragic incredulity shone from his eyes patently he doubted the evidence of his own ears could not believe that such black ingratitude existed in the world absalom oh my son absalom was his unuttered cry his hands fell to his sides his chin sank wretchedly into its own folds his shirt bosom heaved and crinkled arrows of unspeakable injustice had entered the defenceless breast just out of bed he repeated with a pathos that would have brought the judge of any court in france down from the bench to kiss him and i had risen long long before the dawn in the cold and darkness of the night to prepare the sandwiches of monsieur it was too much for me or rather he was i stalked off to the woods in a state of helpless indignation mentally swearing that his day of punishment at my hands was only deferred not abandoned yet secretly fearing that this very oath might live for no purpose but to convict me of perjury his talents were lost in the country he should have sought his fortune in the metropolis and his manner as he summoned me that evening to dinner and indeed throughout the courses partook of the subtle condescension and careless assurance of one who has but faintly enjoyed some too easy triumph i found this so irksome that i might have been goaded into an outbreak of impotent fury had my attention not been distracted by the curious turn of the professor's malady which had renewed its painful assault upon him he came hobbling to table leaning upon saffron's shoulder and made no reference to his singular improvement of the night before nor did i his rheumatism was his own he might do what he pleased with it there was no reason why he should confide the cause of its vagaries to me table talk ran its normal course a great pole's philosophy receiving flagellation at the hands of our incorrigible optimist if he could understand exclaimed keredec that the individual must be immortal before it is born ha then this babbler might have written some intelligence on the surface everything was as usual with our trio with nothing to show any turbulence of undercurrents unless it was a certain alertness in oliver's manner a restrained excitement and the questioning restlessness of his eyes as they sought mine from time to time whatever he wished to ask me he was given no opportunity for the professor carried him off to work when our coffee was finished 
as they departed the young man glanced back at me over his shoulder with that same earnest look of interrogation but it went unanswered by any token or gesture for though i guessed that he wished to know if mrs harman had spoken of him to me it seemed part of my bargain with her to give him no sign that i understood a note lay beside my plate next morning addressed in a writing strange to me one of dashing and vigorous character in the pursuit of thrillingly scientific research it read what with the tumult which possessed me i forgot to mention the bond that links us i too am a painter though as yet unhonoured and unhung it must be only because i lack a gentle hand to guide me if i might sit beside you as you paint the hours pass on leaden wings at quesnay i could shriek do not refuse me a few words of instruction either in the wildwood whither i could support your shrinking steps or from time to time as you work in your studio which i glean from the instructive mr ferry is at les trois pigeons at any hour at any moment i will speed to you i am sir yours if you will but breathe a yes anne elliot to this i returned a reply as much in her own key as i could write it putting my refusal on the ground that i was not at present painting in the studio i added that i hoped her suit might prosper regretting that i could not be of greater assistance to that end and concluded with the suggestion that madame brossard might entertain an offer for lessons in cooking the result of my attempt to echo her vivacity was discomfiting and i was allowed to perceive that epistolary jocularity was not thought to be my line it was miss elizabeth who gave me this instruction three days later on the way to quesnay for second breakfast exercising fairly shamefaced diplomacy i had avoided dining at the chateau again but by arrangement she had driven over for me this morning in the phaeton why are you writing silly notes to that child she demanded as soon as we were away from the inn was it silly you should know do you think that style of humour suitable for a young girl this bewildered me a little but there wasn't anything offensive no miss elizabeth lifted her eyebrows to a height of bland inquiry she mightn't think it rather well rough you're suggesting that she should take cooking lessons but she suggested she might take painting lessons was my feeble protest i only meant to show her i understood that she wanted to get to the inn and why should she care to get to the inn she seemed interested in a young man who was staying there interested is the mildest word for it i can think of pooh such was miss ward's enigmatic retort and though i begged an explanation i got none instead she quickened the horse's gait and changed the subject at the chateau having a mind to offer some sort of apology i looked anxiously about for the subject of our rather disquieting conversation but she was not to be seen until the party assembled at the table set under an awning on the terrace then to my disappointment i found no opportunity to speak to her for her seat was so placed as to make it impossible and she escaped into the house immediately upon the conclusion of the repast hurrying away too pointedly for any attempt to detain her though as she passed she sent me one glance of meek reproach which she was at pains to make elaborately distinct again taking me for her neighbour at the table miss elizabeth talked to me at intervals apparently having nothing just then to make up to mr cresson ingle but not long after we rose she accompanied him upon some excursion of an indefinite nature which led her from my sight thus the others making off to cards indoors and what not i was left to the perusal of the eighteenth-century facade of the chateau one of the most competent restorations in that part of france and of the liveliest interest to the student or practitioner of architecture mrs harman had not appeared at all having gone to call upon some one at Dieu, i was told and a servant informing me on inquiry that miss elliot had retired to her room i was thrust upon my own devices indeed a condition already closely associated in my mind with this picturesque spot 
the likeliest of my devices or at least the one i hit upon was in the nature of an unostentatious retreat i went home however as the day was spoiled for work i chose a roundabout way in fact the longest and took the high road to Dieu. but neither the road nor the town itself when i passed through it rewarded my vague hope that i might see mrs harmon and i strode the long miles in considerable disgruntlement for it was largely in that hope that i had gone to quesnay it put me in no merrier mood to find miss elizabeth's phaeton standing outside the inn in charge of a groom for my vanity encouraged the supposition that she had come out of a fear that my unceremonious departure from quesnay might have indicated that i was hurt or considered myself neglected and i dreaded having to make explanations my apprehensions were unfounded it was not miss elizabeth who had come in the phaeton though a lady from quesnay did prove to be the occupant the sole occupant of the courtyard at sight of her i halted stock still under the archway there she sat a sketch-book on a green table beside her and a board in her lap brazenly painting and a more blushless piece of assurance than miss anne elliot thus engaged these eyes have never beheld she was not so hardened that she did not affect a little timidity at sight of me looking away even more quickly than she looked up while i walked slowly over to her and took the garden chair beside her that gave me a view of her sketch which was a violent little lay-in of shrubbery trees and the skyline of the inn to my prodigious surprise and naturally enough with a degree of pleasure i perceived that it was not very bad not bad at all indeed it displayed a sense of values of placing and even in a young and frantic way of colour here was a young woman of more than accomplishments you see she said squeezing one of the tiny tubes almost dry and continuing to paint with a fine effect of absorption i had to show you that i was in the most abysmal earnest will you take me painting with you i appreciate your seriousness i rejoined has it been rewarded how can i say you haven't told me whether or no i may follow you to the wildwood i mean have you caught another glimpse of mr saffron at that she showed a prettier colour in her cheeks than any in her sketch box but gave no other sign of shame nor even of being flustered cheerfully replying that is far from the point do you grant my burning plea i understand i have offended you you did she said viciously i am sorry i continued i wanted to ask you to forgive me i spoke seriously and that seemed to strike her as odd or needing explanation for she levelled her blue eyes at me and interrupted with something more like seriousness in her own voice than i had yet heard from her what made you think i was offended your look of reproach when you left the table nothing else she asked quickly yes miss ward told me you were yes she drove over with you that's it she exclaimed with vigour and nodded her head as if some suspicion of hers had been confirmed i thought so you thought she had told me no said miss elliot decidedly thought that elizabeth wanted to have her cake and eat it too i don't understand then you'll get no help from me she returned slowly a frown marking her pretty forehead but i was only playing offended and she knew it i thought your note was that fetching she continued to look thoughtful for a moment longer then with a resumption of her former manner the pretence of an earnestness much deeper than the real will you take me painting with you she said if it will convince you that i mean it i'll give up my hopes of seeing that sumptuous mr saffron and go back to quesnay now before he comes home he's been out for a walk a long one since it's lasted ever since early this morning so the waiter told me may i go with you you can't know how enervating it is up there at the chateau all except mrs harmon and even she what about mrs harmon i asked as she paused i think she must be in love what i do think so said the girl she's like it at least but with whom she laughed gaily 
i'm afraid she's my rival not with i began yes with your beautiful and mad young friend but oh it's preposterous i cried profoundly disturbed she couldn't be if you knew a great deal about her i may know more than you think my simplicity of appearance is deceptive she mocked beginning to set her sketch-box in order you don't realize that mrs harmon and i are quite hurled upon each other at quesnay being two ravishingly intelligent women entirely surrounded by large bodies of elementals she has told me a great deal of herself since that evening and i know well i know why she did not come back from d this afternoon for instance why i fairly shouted she slid her sketch into a groove in the box which she closed and rose to her feet before answering then she set her hat a little straighter with a touch looking so fixedly and with such grave interest over my shoulder that i turned to follow her glance and encountered our reflections in a window of the inn her own shed a light upon that mystery at all events i might tell you some day she said indifferently if i gained enough confidence in you through association in daily pursuits my dear young lady i cried with real exasperation i am a working man and this is a working summer for me do you think i'd spoil it she urged gently but i get up with the first daylight to paint i protested and i paint all day she moved a step nearer me and laid her hand warningly upon my sleeve checking the outburst i turned to see what she meant oliver saffron had come in from the road and was crossing to the gallery steps he lifted his hat and gave me a quick word of greeting as he passed and at the sight of his flushed and happy face my riddle was solved for me amazing as the thing was i had no doubt of the revelation ah i said to miss elliot when he had gone i won't have to take pupils to get the answer to my question now End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of the guest of quesnay by booth tarkington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Berard. chapter fourteen ha these philosophers said the professor expanding in discourse a little later these dreamy people who talk of the spirit they tell you that spirit is abstract he waved his great hand in a sweeping semicircle which carried it out of our orange candle-light and freckled it with a cold moonshine which sieved through the loosened screen of honeysuckle ha the folly what do you say it is i asked moving so that the smoke of my cigar should not drift toward oliver who sat looking out into the garden i my friend i do not say that it is but all such things they are only a question of names and when i use the word spirit i mean identity universal identity if you like it is what we all are yes and those flowers too but the spirit of the flowers is not what you smell nor what you see that looks so pretty it is the flowers themselves yet all spirit is only one spirit and one spirit is all spirit and if you tell me this is pantheism i will tell you that you do not understand i don't tell you that said i neither do i understand nor that big keredec either whereupon he loosed the rolling thunder of his laughter nor any brain born of the monkey people but this world is full of proof that everything that exists is all one thing and it is the instinct of that which when it draws us together which makes what we call love even those wicked devils of egoism in our inside is only love which grows too long the wrong way like the finger-nails of the chinese empress young love is a little sprout of universal unity when the young people begin to feel it they are not abstract ha huh? and the young man when he selects he chooses one being from all the others to mean just for him all that great universe of which he is a part this was wandering whimsically far afield but as i caught the good-humoured flicker of the professor's glance at our companion i thought i saw a purpose in his deviation saffron turned toward him wonderingly 
his unconscious eager look remarkably emphasized and brightened all such things are most strange great mysteries continued the professor for when a man has made the selection that being does become all the universe and for him there is nothing else at all nothing else anywhere saffron's cheeks and temples were flushed as they had been when i had saw him returning that afternoon and his eyes were wide fixed upon keredec in a stare of utter amazement yes that is true he said slowly how did you know keredec returned his look with an attentive scrutiny and made some exclamation under his breath which i did not catch but there was no mistaking his high good humour bravo he shouted rising and clapping the other upon the shoulder you will soon cure my rheumatism if you ask me questions like that ho 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 he threw back his head and let the mighty salvos forth ho 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 how do i know the young always they believe they are the only ones who were ever young ho 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 come we shall make those lessons very easy to-night come my friend how could that big old keredec know of such things he is too old too foolish ho 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 as he went up the steps the courtyard reverberating again to his laughter his arm resting on saffron's shoulders but not so heavily as usual the door of their salon closed upon them and for a while keredec's voice could be heard booming cheerfully it ended in another burst of laughter a moment later saffron opened the door and called to me here i answered from my veranda where i had just lighted my second cigar no more work to-night all finished he cried jubilantly springing down the steps i'm coming to have a talk with you amity had removed the candles the moon had withdrawn in fear of a turbulent mob of clouds rioting into our sky from seaward the air smelled of imminent rain and it was so dark that i could see my visitor only as a vague tall shape but a happy excitement vibrated in his rich voice and his step on the gravelled path was light and exultant i won't sit down he said i'll walk up and down in front of the veranda if it doesn't make you nervous for answer i merely laughed and he laughed too in genial response continuing gaily oh it's all so different with me everything is that blind feeling i told you of it's all gone i must have been very babyish the other day i don't think i could feel like that again it used to seem to me that i lived penned up in a circle of blank stone walls i couldn't see over the top for myself at all though now and then keredec would boost me up and let me get a little glimmer of the country road about but never long enough to see what it was really like but it's not so now ah he drew a long breath i'd like to run i think i could run all the way to the top of a pretty fair-sized mountain to-night and then he laughed jump off and ride on the clouds i know how it that is i responded at least i did know a few years ago everything is a jumble with me he went on happily in a confidential tone yet it's a heavenly kind of jumble i can't put anything into words i don't think very well yet though keredec is trying to teach me my thoughts don't run in order and this that's happened seems to make them wilder queer he stopped short what has happened he paused in his sentry go facing me and answered in a low voice i've seen her again yes i know she told me you knew it he said that she had told you yes but that's not all he said his voice rising a little i saw her again the day after she told you you did i murmured oh i tell myself that it's a dream he cried that it can't be true for it has been every day since then that's why i haven't joined you in the woods i have been with her walking with her listening to her looking at her always feeling that it must be unreal and that i must try not to wake up she has been so kind so wonderfully beautifully kind to me she has met you i asked thinking ruefully of george ward now on the high seas in the pleasant company of old hopes renewed she has let me meet her and to-day we lunched at the inn at dives 
and then we walked by the sea all afternoon she gave me the whole day the whole day you see he began to pace again you see i was right and you were wrong she wasn't offended she was glad that i couldn't help speaking to her she has said so do you think i interrupted that she would wish you to tell me this ah she likes you he said so heartily and appearing meanwhile so satisfied with the completeness of his reply that i was fain to take some satisfaction in it myself what i wanted most to say to you he went on is this you remember you promised to tell me whatever you could learn about her and about her husband i remember it's different now i don't want you to he said i want only to know what she tells me herself she has told me very little but i know when the time comes she will tell me everything but i wouldn't hasten it i wouldn't have anything change from just this you mean i mean the way it is if i could hope to see her every day to be in the woods with her or down by the shore oh i don't want to know anything but that no doubt you have told her i ventured a good deal about yourself and was instantly ashamed of myself i suppose i spoke out of a sense of protest against mrs harman's strange lack of conventionality against so charming a lady's losing her head as completely as she seemed to have lost hers and it may have been too out of a feeling of jealousy for poor george possibly even out of a little feeling of the same sort on my own account but i couldn't have said it except for the darkness and as i say i was instantly ashamed it does not whiten my guilt that the shaft did not reach him i've told her all i know he said readily and the unconscious pathos of the answer smote me and all that keredec has let me know you see i haven't but do you think i interrupted quickly anxious in my remorse to divert him from that channel do you think professor keredec would approve if he knew i think he would he responded slowly pausing in his walk again i have a feeling that perhaps he does know and yet i have been afraid to tell him afraid he might try to stop me keep me from going to wait for her but he has a strange way of knowing things i think he knows everything in the world i have felt to-night that he knows this and it's very strange but i-well what was it that made him so glad the light is still burning in his room i said quietly you mean that i ought to tell him his voice rose a little he's done a good deal for you hasn't he i suggested and even if he does know he might like to hear it from you you're right i'll tell him to-night this came with sudden decision but with less than mark what followed but he can't stop me now no one on earth shall do that except madame d'armont herself no one i won't quarrel with that i said dryly throwing away my cigar which had gone out long before he hesitated and then i saw his hand groping toward me in the darkness and rising i gave him mine good night he said and shook my hand as the first sputterings of the coming rain began to patter on the roof of the pavilion i'm glad to tell him i'm glad to have told you ah but isn't this he cried a happy world turning he ran to the gallery steps at last i'm glad he called back over his shoulder i'm glad that i was born a gust of wind blew furiously into the courtyard at that instant and i heard his voice indistinctly but i thought though i might have been mistaken that i caught a final word and that it was again End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the guest of quesnay by booth tarkington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Perard. chapter fifteen the rain of two nights and two days had freshened the woods deepening the green of the tree trunks and washing the dust from the leaves and now under the splendid sun of the third morning we sat painting in a sylvan isle that was like a hall of aladdin's palace the filigreed arches of foliage above us glittering with pendulous raindrops 
but arabian nights palaces are not to my fancy for painting the air rinsed of its color was too sparklingly clean the interstices of sky and the roughly framed distances i prized were brought too close it was one of those days when nature throws herself straight in your face and you are at a loss to know whether she has kissed you or slapped you though you are conscious of the tangle a day in brief more for laughing than for painting and the truth is that i suited its mood only too well and laughed more than i painted though i sat with my easel before me and a picture ready upon my palette to be painted no one could have understood better than i that this was setting a bad example to the acolyte who sat likewise facing an easel ten paces to my left a very sportsmanlike figure of a painter indeed in her short skirt and long coat of woodland brown the fine brown of dead oak leaves a devastating selection of colour that being much the same shade as her hair with brown for her hat too and the veil encircling the small crown thereof and brown again for the stout high lace boots which protected her from the wet tangle underfoot who could have expected so dashing a young person as this to do any real work at painting yet she did narrowing her eyes to the finest point of concentration and applying herself to the task in hand with a persistence which i found on that particular morning far beyond my own powers as she leaned back critically at the imminent risk of capsizing her camp-stool and herself with it in her absorption some ill-suppressed token of amusement must have caught her ear for she turned upon me with suspicion and was instantly moved to moralize upon the reluctance i had shown to accept her as a companion for my excursions taking as her theme in contrast her own present display of ambition all in all a warm if over-coloured sketch of the idle master and the industrious apprentice it made me laugh again upon which she changed the subject an indefinable something tells me she announced coldly that henceforth you needn't be so drastically fearful of being dragged to the chateau for dinner nor dejeuner either did anything ever tell you that i had cause to fear it yes she said but too simply jean ferret anglicize that ruffian's name i muttered mirth immediately withering upon me and you'll know him better to save time will you mention anything you can think of that he hasn't told you miss elliot cocked her head upon one side to examine the work of art she was producing while a slight smile playing about her lips seemed to indicate that she was appeased you and miss ward are old and dear friends aren't you she said absently we are i answered between my teeth for years i have sent her costly jewels she interrupted me by breaking outright into a peal of laughter which rang with such childish delight that i retorted by offering several malevolent observations upon the babbling of french servants and the order of mind attributable to those who listened to them her defence was to affect inattention and paint busily until some time after i had concluded i think she's going to take cressy engel she said dreamily with the air of one whose thoughts have been far far away it looks preponderously like it she's been teeter-tottering these ages and ages between you between whom you and mr ingle she replied not altering her tone in the slightest but she's all for her brother of course and though you're his friend ingle is a personage in the world they court and among the multitudinous things his father left him is an art magazine or one that's long on art or something of that sort i don't know just what so altogether it would be a good thing for dearest mr ward she likes cressy of course though i think she likes you better i managed to find my voice and interrupt the thistle-brained creature what put these fantasias into your head not jean ferret she responded promptly it's cruel of me to break it to you so coarsely i know but if you are ever going to make up your mind to her building as glaring a success of you as she has of her brother i think you must do it now 
she's on the point of accepting mr ingle and what becomes of you will depend upon your conduct in the most immediate future she won't ask you to quesnay again so you'd better go up there on your own accord and on your bended knees too she added as an afterthought i sought for something to say which might have a chance of impressing her a desperate task on the face of it and i mentioned that miss ward was her hostess one might as well have tried to impress amedee she made a little mouth and went on dabbling with her brushes hostess pooh she said cheerfully my infantile father sent me here to be in her charge while he ran home to america mr ward's to paint my portrait when he comes give and take it's simple enough you see here was frankness with a vengeance and i fell back upon silence whereupon a pause ensued to my share of which i imported the deepest shadow of disapproval within my power unfortunately she did not look at me my effort passed with no other effect than to make some of my facial muscles ache portrait of miss e by george ward h c this painfully plain-speaking young lady continued presently on the line at next spring's salon then packed up for the dear ones at home i'd as soon own an art bronze myself or a nice clean porcelain arab no doubt you've forgotten for the moment i said that mr ward is my friend not in painting he isn't she returned quickly i consider his work altogether creditable it's carefully done conscientious effective isn't that true of the ladies in the hairdresser's windows she asked with assumed artlessness can't you say a kind word for them good gentlemen and heaven bless you why shan't i be asked to quesnay again she laughed you haven't seemed fanatically appreciative of your opportunities when you have been there you might have carried her off from crescent angle instead of vice versa but after all you aren't here she paused and looked at me appraisingly for a moment you aren't the most piratical dash in and dash out and leave everything upside down behind you sort of van are you no i believe i'm not however that's only a small half of the reason miss elliot went on she's furious on account of this these were vague words and i said so oh this she explained my being here you're letting me come impropriety all of that a sharp whistle issued from her lips oh the excoriating things she's said of my pursuing you but doesn't she know that it's only part of your siege of madame brossard's that it's a subterfuge in the hope of catching a glimpse of oliver saffron no she cried her eyes dancing i told her that but she thinks it's only a subterfuge in the hope of catching more than a glimpse of you i joined laughter with her then she was the first to stop and looking at me somewhat doubtfully she said whereas the truth is that it's neither you know very well that i want to paint certainly i agreed at once your devotion to your art and your hope of spending half an hour at madame brossard's now and then are separable which reminds me wouldn't you like me to look at your sketch no not yet she jumped up and brought her camp-stool over to mine i feel that i could better bear what you'll say of it after i've had some lunch not a syllable of food has crossed my lips since coffee at dawn i spread before her what amity had prepared not sandwiches for the pocket to-day but a wicker hamper one end of which we let rest upon her knees the other upon mine and at sight of the foie gras the delicate devilled partridge the truffled salad the fine yellow cheese and the long bottle of good red bun revealed when the cover was off i could almost have forgiven the old rascal for his scandal-mongering as for my vis-a-vis -vis, she pronounced it a maddening sight fall to me my merry man she added and eat your fill of this fair pasty under the greenwood tree obeying her instructions with right good will and the lady likewise evincing no hatred of the viands we made a cheerful meal of it topping it with peaches and bunches of grapes it is unfair to let you do all the catering said miss elliot after carefully selecting the largest and best peach 
jean ferret's friend does that i returned watching her rather intently as she dexterously peeled the peach she did it very daintily i had to admit that though i regretted to observe indications of the gourmet in one so young but when it was peeled clean she set it on a fresh green leaf and to my surprise gave it to me you see she continued not observing my remorseful conclusion i couldn't destroy elizabeth's peace of mind and then raid her larder to boot that poor lady i make her trouble enough but it's nothing to what she's going to have when she finds out some things that she must find out what is that about mrs harman was the serious reply elizabeth hasn't a clue clue i echoed to louise's strange affair miss elliot's expression had grown as serious as her tone it is strange the strangest thing i ever knew but there's your own case i urged why should you think it strange of her to take an interest in saffron i adore him of course she said he is the most glorious-looking person i have ever seen but on my word she paused and as her gaze met mine i saw real earnestness in her eyes i'm afraid i was half joking the other day but now i'm really afraid louise is beginning to be in love with him oh mightn't it be only interest so far i said no it's much more and i've grown so fond of her the girl went on her voice unexpectedly verging upon tremulousness she's quite wonderful in her way such an understanding sort of woman and generous and kind there are so many things turning up in a party like ours at quesnay that show what people are really made of and she's a rare fine spirit it seems a pity with such a miserable first experience as she had that this should happen oh i know she continued rapidly cutting off a half-formed protest of mine he isn't mad and i'm sorry i tried to be amusing about it the night you dined at the chateau i know perfectly well he's not insane but i'm absolutely sure from one thing and another that well he isn't all there he's as beautiful as a seraph and probably as good as one but something is missing about him and it begins to look like a second tragedy for her you mean she really i began yes i do she returned with a catch in her throat she comes to my room when the others are asleep not that she tells me a great deal but it's in the air somehow she's told me with such a strange sort of gaiety of their meeting and his first joining her and there was something underneath as if she thought i might be really serious in my ravings about him and yes as if she meant to warn me off and the other night when i saw her after their lunching together at Dieu, i asked her teasingly if she'd had a happy day and she laughed the prettiest laugh i ever heard and put her arms around me then suddenly broke out crying and ran out of the room but that may have been no more than overstrained nerves i feebly suggested of course it was she cried regarding me with justifiable astonishment it's the cause of their being overstrained that interests me it's all so strange and distressing she continued more gently that i wish i weren't there to see it and there's poor george ward coming ah and when elizabeth learns of it mrs harman had her way once in spite of everything i said thoughtfully yes she was a headstrong girl of nineteen then but let's not think it could go as far as that there she threw a peach stone over her shoulder and sprang up gaily let's not talk of it i think of it enough it's time for you to give me a racking criticism on my morning's work taking off her coat as she spoke she unbuttoned the cuffs of her manly blouse and rolled up her sleeves as far as they would go preparations which i observed with some perplexity if you intend any violence said i in case my views of your work should meet your own i think i'll be leaving wait she responded and kneeling upon one knee beside a bush near by thrust her arms elbow deep under the outer mantle of leaves shaking the stems vigorously and sending down a shower of sparkling drops never lived sane man or madman since time began who seeing her then 
could or would have denied that she made the very prettiest picture ever seen by any person or persons whatsoever but her purpose was difficult to fathom pursuing it i remarked that it was improbable that birds would be nesting so low it's for a finger bowl she said briskly and rising this most practical of her sex dried her hands upon a fresh serviette from the hamper last night's rain is worth two birds in the bush with that she readjusted her sleeves lightly donned her coat and preceded me to her easel now she commanded slaughter it's what i let you come with me for i looked at her sketch with much more attention than i had given the small board she had used as a bait in the courtyard of les trois pigeons to-day she showed a larger ambition and a larger canvas as well or perhaps i should say a larger burlap for she had chosen to paint upon something strongly resembling a square of coffee sacking but there was no doubt that she had found colour in a swashbuckling bullying style of forcing it to be there whether it was or not and to vibrate whether it did or not there was not much to be said for the violent kind of thing she had done always hushes me and even when it is well done i am never sure whether its right place is the salon des independents or the luxembourg it seems dreadful and yet sometimes i fear in secret that it may be a real transition or even an awakening and that the men i began with and i are standing still the older men called us lunatics once and the critics said we were daring but that was long ago well she said i had to speak so i paraphrased a mot of degas i think it was degas and said if Rousseau could come to life and see the sketch of yours i imagine he would be very much interested but if he saw mine he might say that is my fault oh she cried her colour rising quickly she looked troubled for a second then her eyes twinkled you're not going to let my work make a difference between us are you i'll even try to look at it from your own point of view i answered stepping back several yards to see it better though i should have had to retire about a quarter of the length of the city block to see it quite from her own point of view she moved with me both of us walking backward i began for a day like this with all the colour in the trees themselves and so very little in the air there came an interruption a voice of unpleasant and wiry nasality speaking from behind us well well it said so here we are again i faced about and beheld just emerged from a bypath a fox-faced young man whose light well-poised figure was jauntily clad in grey serge with scarlet waistcoat and tie white shoes upon his feet and a white hat gaily beribboned upon his head a recollection of the dusky road and a group of people about pere baudry's lamplit door flickered across my mind the historical tourist i exclaimed the highly pedestrian tripper from Fouvy. you got me right my dear friend he replied with condescension i recollect meeting you perfect and i was interested to learn said i carefully observing the effect of my words upon him that you had been to la trois pigeons after all perhaps i might put it you had been through les trois pigeons for the maitre d'hôtel informed me you had investigated every corner that wasn't locked sure he returned with rather less embarrassment than a brazen vishnu would have exhibited under the same circumstances he showed me what pictures they say was in your studio i'll look em over again for ye one of these days some of em was right good you will be visiting near enough for me to avail myself of the opportunity right in the pigeon house my friend i've just come down to put in a few days there he responded coolly there's a young feller in this neighbourhood i take a kind of family interest in who is that i asked quickly for answer he produced the effect of a laugh by widening and lifting one side of his mouth leaving the other meantime rigid don't let me interrupt the conversation with your lady friend he said winningly what they call talking high arts wasn't it i'd like to hear some End of chapter fifteen
Chapter Sixteen of the Guest of Quesnay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Guest of Quesnay, by Booth Tarkington. Chapter Sixteen. Miss Elliot's expression, when I turned to observe the effect of the intruder upon her, was found to be one of brilliant delight. With glowing eyes, her lips parted in a breathless ecstasy, she gazed upon the newcomer, evidently fearing to lose a syllable that fell from his lips. Moving closer to me, she whispered urgently, Keep him! Oh, keep him! To detain him, for a time at least, was my intention though my motive was not merely to afford her pleasure. The advent of the young man had produced a singularly disagreeable impression upon me, quite apart from any antagonism I might have felt toward him as a type. Strange suspicions leaped into my mind, formless, in the surprise of the moment, but rapidly groping toward definite outline, and following hard upon them crept a tingling apprehension, the reappearance of this rattish youth, casual as was the air with which he strove to invest it, began to assume, for me, the character of a theatrical entrance of unpleasant portent, a suggestion just now enhanced by an absurdly obvious notion of his own, that he was enacting a part. This was written all over him, most legibly in his attitude of the knowing amateur, as he surveyed Miss Elliot's painting patronizingly, his head on one side, his cane in the crook of his elbows behind his back, and his body teetering genteelly as he shifted his weight from his toes to his heels and back again, nodding meanwhile a slight but judicial approbation. Now, about how much, he said slowly, would you expect to get for a picture that size? It isn't mine, I informed him. You don't tell me it's the little ladies. What? He bowed genially and favored Miss Elliot with a stare of warm admiration. Pretty a thing as I ever see, he added. Oh, she cried with an ardor that choked her slightly. Thank you. Oh, I meant the picture, he said hastily, evidently nonplussed by a gratitude so fervent. The incorrigible damsel cast down her eyes in modesty, and I had hoped, she breathed, something so different. I could not be certain whether or not he caught the whisper. I thought he did. At all events, the surface of his easy assurance appeared somewhat disarranged, and perhaps to restore it by performing the rites of etiquette, he said, Well, I expect the smart thing now is to pass the cards, but mine's in my grip, and it ain't unpacked yet. The name you'd see on em is Oil Poissy. Oil Poissy echoed Miss Elliot, turning to me in genuine astonishment. Mr. Earl Percy, I translated. Oh, rapturous, she cried, her face radiant. And won't Mr. Percy give us his opinion of my art? Mr. Percy was in doubt how to take her enthusiasm. He seemed on the point of turning surly and hesitated, while a sharp vertical line appeared on his small forehead. But he evidently concluded after a deep glance at her, that if she was making game of him, it was in no ill-natured spirit. Nay, I think that for a few moments he suspected her liveliness to be some method of her own for the incipient stages of a flirtation. Finally, he turned again to the easel, and as he examined the painting thereon at closer range, amazement overspread his features. However, pulling himself together, he found himself able to reply, and with great gallantry. Well, only to think them little hands could have done all that rough wake. The unintended viciousness of this retort produced an effect so marked that except for my growing uneasiness, I might have enjoyed her expression. As it was, I saved her face by entering into the conversation with a question which I put quickly. You intend pursuing your historical researches in the neighborhood? The facial contortion, which served him for a laugh, 
and at the same time as a symbol of unfathomable reserve, was repeated, accompanied by a jocose manifestation in the nature of a sharp and taunting cackle, which seemed to indicate a conviction that he was getting much the best of it in some conflict of wits. Them fairy tales I handed you about old John Dark and William the Conquer, he said, say they must have made you sore afterwards. On the contrary, I was much interested in everything pertaining to your too brief visit, I returned. I am even more so now. Well, my friend, he shot me a sidelong distrustful glance, keep your eyes open. That is just the point, I laughed, with intentional significance, for I meant to make Mr. Percy talk as much as I could. To this end, remembering that specimens of his kind are most indiscreet when carefully enraged, I added, simulating his own manner, eyes open and doors locked, what? At this I heard a gasp of astonishment from Miss Elliot, who must have been puzzled indeed. But I was intent upon the other. He proved perfectly capable of being insulted. I guess they ain't much need a lock in your door, he retorted darkly. Not from what I saw when I was in your studio. He should have stopped there, for the hit was palpable and justified. But in his resentment he overdid it. You needn't be scared of anybody's cartin' off them pictures, young feller. Whoosh! And from the looks of the clothes I saw hangin' on the wall, he continued, growing more nettled as I smiled cheerfully upon him, I don't believe you've got any worries comin' about them, neither. I suppose our tastes are different, I said, letting my smile broaden. There might be protection in that. His stare at me was protracted to an unseemly length before the sting of this remark reached him. It penetrated finally, however, and in his sharp change of posture there was a lightning flicker of the experienced boxer, but he checked the impulse and took up the task of obliterating me in another way. As I tell the little dame here, he said, pitching his voice higher and affecting the plaintive, I make no passes at a friend o' her, not in front o' her anyways, but when it comes to these here old ancient curiosities, he cackled again, loudly. Well, I guess them clothes I see that day can hand it out to anything they got in the museums. Look here, I says to the waiter. These must be left over from old Jeanne d'Arc herself, I says. Talk about your relics, I says. Whoosh, I like to died. He laughed violently and concluded by turning upon me with a contemptuous flourish of his stick. You think I didn't know what makes you so raw? The form of repartee necessary to augment this ill humor was, of course, a matter of simple mechanism for one who had not yet entirely forgotten his student days in the quarter, and I delivered it airily, though I shivered inwardly that Miss Elliot should hear. Everything will be all right if, when you dine at the inn, you'll sit with your back toward me. To my shamed surprise, this roustabout wit drew a nervous, silvery giggle from her, and that completed the work with Mr. Percy, whose face grew scarlet with anger. You're a hot one, you are, he sneered with shocking bitterness. You're quite the teaser, ain't ye, so long as your lady friend is looking on. I guess there'll be a few surprises coming your way before long. Perhaps I couldn't give you one now, if I had a mind to. Pshaw, I laughed, and, venturing at hazard, said, I know all you know. Oh, you do, he cried scornfully. I reckon you might set up and take a little notice, though, if you know that uh, I know all you know. Not a bit of it. No? Maybe you think I don't know what makes you so raw with me. Maybe you think I don't know who you got so thick with at this here pigeon house. Maybe you think I don't know who them people are. No, you don't. You have learned, I said, trying to control my excitement, nothing. Whoever hired you for a spy lost the money. You don't know anything. I don't. And with that his voice went into a half shriek. Maybe you think I'm down here for my health. Maybe you think I come down for a pleasant walk in the woods right now. Maybe you think I ain't seen no other lady friend of yours besides this and today. And maybe I didn't see who was with her, yes. 
and maybe you think I know no other times he's been with her. Maybe you think I ain't been layin' low over at Dives. Maybe I don't know a few real names in this neighborhood. Oh, no, maybe not. You know what the mater d'hotel told you, nothing more. How about the name, Oliver Saffron, he cried fiercely. And at last, though I had expected it, I uttered an involuntary exclamation. How about it, he shouted, advancing toward me triumphantly, shaking his forefinger in my face. Eh? Hey, that stings some, does it? Sounds kind of like a false name, doesn't it? Got you where the hair is short that time, didn't I? Speaking of names, I retorted, Oil Poissy doesn't seem to ring particularly true to me. It'll be good enough for you, young feller, he responded angrily. It may belong to me, and then again it maybe don't. It ain't gonna get me in no trouble. I'll look out for that. Your side's where the trouble is. That's what's eaten into you. And I'll tell you, Flatfoot, you're getting rough with me and playing Charlie the show off in front of your lady friends. will all go down in the bill. These people you've got so chummy with, they'll pay for it all right. Don't you shed no tears over that. You couldn't by any possibility, I said deliberately, with as much satire as I could command. You couldn't possibly mean that any sum of mere money might be a salve for the injuries my unkind words have inflicted. Once more he seemed upon the point of destroying me physically, but with a slight shudder controlled himself. Stepping close to me, he thrust his head forward and measured the emphases of his speech by his right forefinger upon my shoulder as he said, You paint this in your pictures, my dear friend. There's just as much law in this country as there is on the corner of Twenty Thoid Street and Fifth Avenue. You keep out of the way of it, or you'll get runned over. Delivering a final tap on my shoulder as a last warning, he wheeled deftly upon his heel, addressed Miss Elliot briefly, Glad to know you, lady, and striking into the by-path by which he had approached us, was soon lost to sight. The girl faced me excitedly. What is it? she cried. It seemed to me you insulted him deliberately. I did. You wanted to make him angry? Yes. Oh, I thought so, she exclaimed breathlessly. I knew there was something serious underneath. It's about Mr. Saffron? It is serious indeed, I fear, I said. And turning to my own easel, I began to get my traps together. I'll tell you the little I know, because I want you to tell Mrs. Harmon what has just happened, and you'll be able to do it better if you understand what is understandable about the rest of it. You mean you wouldn't tell me so that I could understand for myself? There was a note of genuine grieved reproach in her voice. Ah, then I've made you think me altogether a harebrain. I haven't had time to tell you what I think of you, I said brusquely, and strangely enough it seemed to please her. But I paid little attention to that, continuing quickly. When Professor Karadek and Mr. Saffron came to Les Trois Pigeons, they were so careful to keep out of everyone's sight that one might have suspected that they were in hiding, and, in fact, I'm sure that they were. Though, as time passed and nothing alarming happened, they felt reassured and allowed themselves more liberty. It struck me that Karadek at first dreaded that they might be traced to the inn, and I'm afraid his fear was justified, for one night before I came to know them, I met Mr. Percy on the road. He'd visited Madame Brossard's and pumped Aim D. Dry, but clumsily tried to pretend to me that he had not been there at all. At the time, I did not connect him even remotely with Professor Karadek's anxieties. I imagined he might have an eye to the spoons, but it's as ridiculous to think him a burglar as it would be to take him for a detective. What he is, or what he is to do with Mr. Saffron, I can guess no more than I can guess the cause of Karadek's fears. But the moment I saw him today, saw that he'd come back, I knew it was that, and tried to draw him out. You heard what he said. There's no doubt that Saffron stands in danger of some kind. It may be inconsiderable or even absurd, but it's evidently imminent. And no matter what it is, Mrs. Harmon must be kept out of it. I want you to see her as soon as you can, and ask her from me. No, persuade her for yourself. 
not to leave Quesnay for a day or two. I mean that she absolutely must not meet Mr. Saffron again until we know what all this means. Will you do it? That I will, and she began hastily to get her belongings in marching order. I'll do anything in the world you'll let me, and, oh, I hope they can't do anything to poor Mr. Saffron. Our sporting friend had evidently seen him with Mrs. Harmon today. I said, Do you know if they went to the beach again? I only know she meant to meet him, but she told me she'd be back at the chateau by four. If I start now, wasn't the phaeton to be sent to the inn for you? Not until six, she returned briskly, folding her easel and strapping it to her camp stool with precision. Isn't it shorter by the woods? You've only to follow this path to the second crossing and then turn to the right, I responded. I shall hurry back to Madame Brossard's to see Karadek, and here, I extended my hand toward her traps, of which in a neatly practical fashion she had made one close pack. Let me have your things, and I'll take care of them at the inn for you. They're heavy, and it's a long trudge. You have your own to carry, she answered, swinging the strap over her shoulder. It's something of a walk for you, too. No, no, let me have them, I protested, for the walk before her was long, and the things would be heavy indeed before it ended. Go your ways, she laughed, and as my hand still remained extended, she grasped it with her own and gave it a warm and friendly shake. Hurry, and with an optimism which took my breath, she said, I know you can make it come out all right. Besides, I'll help you. With that, she turned and started manfully upon her journey. I stared after her for a moment or more, watching the pretty brown dress flashing in and out of shadow among the ragged greeneries, shafts of sunshine now and then flashing upon her hair. Then I picked up my own pack and set out for the inn. Everyone knows that the more serious and urgent the errand a man may be upon, the more incongruous are apt to be the thoughts that skip into his mind. As I went through the woods that day, breathless with haste and curious fears, my brain became suddenly unaccountably busy with a dream I had had two nights before. I had not recalled this dream on waking. The recollection of it came to me now for the first time. It was a usual enough dream, wandering and unlifelike, not worth the telling, and I had been thinking so constantly of Mrs. Harmon that there was nothing extraordinary in her worthless ex-husband's being part of it. And yet, looking back upon that last hurried walk of mine through the forest, I see how strange it was that I could not quit remembering how, in my dream, I had gone motoring up Mount Pilatus with the man I had seen so pitiably demolished on the Versailles Road two years before, Larrabee Harmon. End of chapter 16chapter 17 of the guest of quesnay by booth tarkington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by matt perard chapter 17 keredick was alone in his salon extended at ease upon a long chair an ottoman and a stool when i burst in upon him a portentous volume was in his lap and a prolific pipe smoking up from his great cloud of beard gave the final reality to the likeness he thus presented of a range of hills ending in a volcano but he rolled the book cavalierly to the floor limbered up by sections to receive me and offered me a hearty welcome ha my dear sir he cried you take pity on the lonely care deck you make him a visit i could not wish better for myself we shall have a good smoke and a good talk you are improved to-day i asked it may be a little slyly improve he repeated inquiringly your rheumatism i mean ha yes that rheumatism he shouted and throwing back his head rocked the room with sudden laughter Phew! but it is gone almost oh i am much better and soon i shall be able to go in the woods again with my boy he pushed a chair toward me come light your cigar 
he will not return for an hour perhaps and there is plenty of time for the smoke to blow away so it is better now we shall talk yes i said i wanted to talk with you that is a what you call ha huh, yes a coincidence he returned stretching himself again in the long chair a happy coincidence for i have wished to talk with you but you are away so early for all day and in the evening oliver he is always here i think what i wanted to talk about concerns him particularly yes the professor leaned forward looking at me gravely that is another coincidence but you shall speak first commence then i feel that you know me at least well enough i began rather hesitatingly to be sure that i would not for the world make any effort to intrude in your affairs or mr saffron's and that i would not force your confidence in the remotest no 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 he interrupted please do not fear i shall misinterpretate whatever you will say you are our friend we know it very well i pursued then i speak with no fear of offending when you first came to the inn i couldn't help seeing that you took a great many precautions for secrecy and when you afterward explained these precautions to me on the ground that you feared somebody might think mr saffron not quite sane and that such an impression might injure him later well i could not help seeing that your explanation did not cover all the ground it is true it did not he ran his huge hand through the heavy white waves of his hair and shook his head vigorously no i knew it my dear sir i knew it well but what could i do i would not have told my own mother this much i can say to you we came here at a risk but i thought that with great care it might be made little and i thought a great good thing might be accomplished if we should come here something so fine so wonderful that even if the danger had been great i would have risked it i will tell you a little more i think that great thing is being accomplished here he rose to his feet excitedly and began to pace the room as he talked the ancient floor shaking with his tread i think it is done and ha my dear sir if it should be this big keredec will not have lived in vain it was a great task i undertake with my young man and the glory to see it finish is almost here even if the danger should come the thing is done for all that is real and has true meaning is inside the soul it was in connection with the risk you have mentioned that i came to talk i returned with some emphasis for i was convinced of the reality of mr earl percy and also very certain that he had no existence inside or outside a soul i think it necessary that you should know but the professor was launched i might as well have swept the rising tide with the broom he talked with magnificent vehemence for twenty minutes his theme being some theory of his own that the individuality of a soul is immortal and that even in perfection the soul cannot possibly merge into any nirvana meantime i wondered how mr percy was employing his time but after one or two ineffectual attempts to interrupt i gave myself to silence until the oration should be concluded and so it is with my boy he proclaimed coming at last to the case in hand the spirit of him the real oliver saffron that has never changed the outside of him those things that belong to him like his memory they have changed but not himself for himself is eternal and unchangeable i have taught him yes i have helped him get the small things we can add to our possession a little knowledge maybe a little power of judgment but my dear sir i tell you that such things are only possessions of a man they are not the man all that a man is or ever shall be he is when he is a baby so with oliver he had lived a little while twenty-six years perhaps when like that he became almost as a baby again he could remember how to talk but not much more he had lost his belongings they were gone from the lobe of the brain where he had stored them but he was not gone no part of the real himself was lacking then presently they send him to me to make new his belongings to restore his possessions 
ha what a task to take him with nothing in the world of his own and see that he get only good possessions good knowledge good experience i took him to the mountains of the tyrol two years and there his body became strong and splendid while his brain was taking in the stores it was quick for his brain had retained some habits it was not a baby's brain and some small part of its old stores had not been lost but if anything useless or bad remain we empty it out i and those mountain with their pure air now i say he is all good and the work was good i am proud but i wish to restore all that was good in his life your keredec is something of a poet you may put it much the old fool and for that greatest restoration of all i have brought my boy back to france since it was necessary it was a madness and i thank the good god i was mad enough to do it i cannot tell you yet my dear sir but you shall see you shall see what the folly of that old keredec has done you shall see you shall and i promise it what a paradise when the good god helps an old fool's dream can make a half-light had broken upon me as he talked pacing the floor thundering his pain of triumph his titanic gestures bruising the harmless air only one explanation incredible but possible sufficed anything was possible i thought anything was probable with this dreamer whom the trump of fame executing a whimsical fantasia proclaimed a man of science by the wildest chance i gasped you don't mean that you wanted him to fall in love he had reached the other end of the room but at this he whirled about on me his laughter rolling out again till it might have been heard at pere baudry's ha my dear sir you have said it but you knew it you told him to come to me and tell me but i mean that you unless i utterly misunderstand you seem to imply that you had selected some one now in france whom you planned that he should care for that you had selected the lady whom you know as madame d'armand again he shouted you have said it professor keredec i returned with asperity i have no idea how you came to conceive such a preposterous scheme but i agree heartily that the word for it is madness in the first place i must tell you that her name is not even diamond my dear sir i know it was the mistake of that absurd amadie she is mrs harman you knew it i cried hopelessly confused but oliver still speaks of her as madame diamond he does not know she has not told him but why haven't you told him ha that is a story a poem he cried beginning to pace the floor again a ballad as old as the oldest of provence there is a reason my dear sir which i cannot tell you but it lies within the romance of what you agree is my madness some day i hope you shall understand and applaud in the meantime i said sharply as he paused for breath there is a keen-faced young man who took a room in the inn this morning and who has come to spy upon you i believe what is it you say he came to a sudden stop i had not meant to deliver my information quite so abruptly but there was no help for it now and i repeated the statement giving him a terse account of my two encounters with the rattish youth and adding he seemed to be certain that oliver saffron is an assumed name and he made a threatening reference to the laws of france the effect upon keredec was a very distinct pallor he faced me silently until i had finished then in a voice grown suddenly husky asked do you think he came back to the inn is he here now i do not know we must learn i must know that at once and he went to the door let me go instead i suggested it can't make little difference if he see me said the professor swallowing with difficulty and displaying as he turned to me a look of such profound anxiety that i was as sorry for him now as i had been irritated a few minutes earlier by his galliard air castles i do not know this man nor does he know me but i have fear 
his beard moved as though his chin were trembling i have fear that i know his employers still it may be better if you go bring somebody here that we can ask shall i find amadie no 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 that babbler find madame rosard i stepped out to the gallery to discover madame brossard emerging from a door on the opposite side of the courtyard amadie glouglou and a couple of carters deploying before her with some light trunks and bags which they were carrying into the passage she had just quitted i summoned her quietly she came briskly up the steps and into the room and i closed the door madame brossard said the professor you have a new client to-day that monsieur who arrived this morning i suggested he was an american said the hostess knitting her dark brows but i do not think that he was exactly a monsieur bravo i murmured that sketches a likeness it is this percy without a doubt that is it she returned monsieur poissy is the name he gave is he at the inn now no monsieur but two friends for whom he engaged apartments have just arrived who are they asked keredec quickly it is a lady and a monsieur from paris but not married they have taken separate apartments and she has a domestic with her a negress algerian what are their names it is not ten minutes that they are installed they have not given me their names what is the lady's appearance monsieur the professor replied the hostess demurely she is not beautiful but what is she demanded keredec impatiently and it could be seen that he was striving to control a rising agitation is she blonde is she brunette is she young is she old is she french english spanish i think said madame brossard i think one would call her spanish but she is very fat not young and with a great deal too much rouge she stopped with an audible intake of breath staring at my friend's white face eh it is bad news she cried and when one has been so ill keredec checked her with an imperious gesture monsieur saffron and i leave at once he said i shall meet him on the road he will not return to the inn we go to to Trouville. see that no one knows that we have gone until to-morrow if possible i shall leave fees for the servants with you go now prepare your bill and bring it to me at once i shall write you where to send our trunks quick and you my friend he turned to me as madame brossard obviously distressed and frightened but none the less intelligent for that scurried away to do his bidding my friend will you help us for we need it anything in the world go to pere Baudry. have him put the least tired of his three horses to his lightest cart and wait in the road beyond the cottage stand in the road yourself while that is being done oliver will come that way detain him i will join you there i have only to see to my papers at the most twenty minutes go quickly my friend i strode to the door and out to the gallery i was halfway down the steps before i saw that oliver saffron was already in the courtyard coming toward me from the archway with a light and buoyant step he looked up waving his hat to me his face lighted with a happiness most remarkable and brighter even than the strong midsummer sunshine flaming over him dressed in white as he was and with the air of victory he wore he might have been at that moment a figure from some marble triumph youthful conquering crowned with the laurel i had time only to glance at him to take him as it were between two shutter flicks of the instantaneous eyelid and with him the courtyard flooded with sunshine and the figure of madame brossard emerging from her little office amadie coming from the kitchen bearing a white covered tray and entering from the road upon the trail of saffron but still in the shadow of the archway the discordant fineries and hatchet face of the ex-pedestrian and tourist my antagonist of the forest i had opened my mouth to call a warning hurry was the word i should have said but it stopped at her the second syllable was never uttered 
there came a violent outcry raucous and shrill as the wail of a captured hen and out of the passage across the courtyard floundered a woman fantastically dressed in green and gold her coarse blue-black hair fell dishevelled upon her shoulders from which her gown hung precariously unfastened as if she had abandoned her toilet halfway she was abundantly fat double-chinned coarse greasy smeared with blue pencillings carmine enamel and rouge at the scream saffron turned she made straight at him crying wildly enfin mon mari mon mari c'est moi c'est ta femme mon coeur she threw herself upon him her arms about his neck with a tropical ferocity that was a very paroxysm of triumph embrassez moi l'arabie embrassez moi she cried horrified outraged his eyes blazing he flung her off with a violence surpassing her own and with loathing unspeakable she screamed that he was killing her calling him husband and tried to fasten herself upon him again but he leapt backward beyond the reach of her clutching hands and turning plunged to the steps and staggered up them the woman following from above me leaned the stricken face of keredec he caught saffron under the arm and half lifted him to the gallery while she strove to hold him by the knees oh christ gasped saffron is this the woman the giant swung him across the gallery and into the open door with one great sweep of the arm strode in after him and closed and bolted the door the woman fell in a heap at the foot of the steps uttered a cracked simulation of the cry of a broken heart name of a name of god she wailed after all these years and my husband strikes me then it was that what had been in my mind as a monstrous suspicion become a certainty for i recognized the woman she was mariana la bella mariana la marciana if i had ever known larrabee harman if instead of the two strange glimpses i had caught of him i had been familiar with his gesture walk intonation even perhaps if i had ever heard his voice the truth might have come to me long ago larrabee harman oliver saffron was larrabee harman End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the guest of quesnay by booth tarkington this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 18 I do not like to read those poets who write of pain as if they loved it. The study of suffering is for the cold analyst, for the vivisectionist, for those who may transfuse their knowledge of it to the ultimate good of mankind and although i am so heavily endowed with curiosity concerning the people i find about me my gift or curse whichever it may be knows pause at the gates of the house of calamity so if it were possible i would not speak of the agony of which i was a witness that night in the apartment of my friends at madame brossard's i went with reluctance but there was no choice keredec had sent for me when i was about fifteen a boy cousin of mine several years younger terribly injured himself on the fourth of july and i sat all night in the room with him helping his mother somehow he had learned that there was no hope of saving his sight he was an imaginative child and realized the whole meaning of the catastrophe the eternal darkness and he understood that the thing had been done that there was no going back of it this very certainly increased the intensity of his rebellion a thousandfold i will have my eyes he screamed i will i will keredec had told his tragic ward too little the latter had understood but vaguely the nature of the catastrophe which overhung his return to france and now that it was indeed concrete and definite the guardian was forced into fuller disclosures every word making the anguish of the listener more intolerable 
it was the horizonless despair of a child and that profound protest i had so often seen smouldering in his eyes culminated at its crisis in a wild flame of revolt the shame of the revelation passed over him there was nothing of the disastrous drunkard sober learning what he had done to him it seemed that he was being forced to suffer for the sins of another man do you think that you can make me believe i did this he cried that i made life unbearable for her drove her from me and took this hideous painted old woman in her place it's a lie you can't make me believe such a monstrous lie as that you can't you can't he threw himself violently upon the couch face downward shuddering from head to foot my poor boy it is the truth said keredec kneeling beside him and putting a great arm across his shoulders it is what a thousand men are doing this night nothing is more common or more unexplainable or more simple of all the nations it is the same wherever life has become artificial and the poor foolish young men have too much money and nothing to do you do not understand it but our friend here and i we understand because we remember what we have been seeing all our life you say it is not you who did such crazy horrible things and you are right when this poor woman who was so painted and greasy first caught you when you began to give your money and your time and your life to her when she got you into this horrible marriage with her you were blind you went staggering in a bad dream your soul hid away far down inside you with its hands over its face if it could have once stood straight if the eyes of your body could have once been clean for it to look through if you could have once been as you are to-day or as you were when you were a little child you would have cried out with horror both of her and of yourself as you do now and you would have run away from her and from everything you had put in your life but in your suffering you must rejoice the triumph is that your mind hates that old life as greatly as your soul hates it you are as good as if you had never been the wild fellow yes the wicked fellow that you were for a man who shakes off his sin is clean he stands as pure as if he had never sinned but though his emancipation can be so perfect there is a law that he cannot escape from the result of all the bad and foolish things he has done for every act every breath you draw is immortal and each has a consequence that is never ending and so now though you are purified the suffering from these old actions is here and you must abide it ah but that is a little thing nothing that suffering compared to what you have gained for you have gained your own soul the desperate young man on the couch answered only with the sobbing of a broken-hearted child i came back to my pavilion after midnight but i did not sleep though i lay upon my bed until dawn then i went for a long hard walk breakfasted at dives and begged a ride back to madame brossard's in a peasant's cart which was going that way i found george ward waiting for me on the little veranda of the pavilion looking handsomer and more prosperously distinguished and distinguishedly prosperous and generally well conditioned than ever as i told him i have some news for you he said after the hearty greeting an announcement in fact wait i glanced at the interested attitude of mr earl percy who was breakfasting at a table significantly near the gallery steps and led the way into the pavilion you may as well not tell it in the hearing of that young man i said when the door was closed he is eccentric so i gathered returned ward smiling from his attire but it really wouldn't matter who heard it elizabeth's going to marry Cresson ingle that is the news the announcement you spoke of yes that is it to save my life i could not have told at that moment what else i had expected or feared that he might say but certainly i took a deep breath of relief i am very glad i said it should be a happy alliance on the whole i think it will be he returned thoughtfully 
ingle's done his share of hard living and i once had a notion he glanced smiling at me well i dare say you know my notion but it is a good match for elizabeth and not without advantages on many counts you see it's time i married myself she feels that very strongly and i think her decision to accept ingle is partly due to her wish to make all clear for a new mistress of my household though that's putting it in a rather grandiloquent way he laughed and as you probably guess i have an idea that some such arrangement might be somewhere on the wings of the wind on its way to me before long he laughed again but i did not and noting my silence he turned upon me a more scrutinizing look than he had yet given me and said my dear fellow is something the matter you look quite haggard you haven't been ill no i've had a bad night that's all oh i heard something of a riotous scene taking place over here he said one of the gardeners was talking about it to elizabeth your bad night wouldn't be connected with that would it you haven't been plain samaritan what was it you heard i asked quickly i didn't pay much attention he said that there was great excitement at madame brossard's because a strange woman had turned up and claimed an insane young man at the end for her husband and that they had a fight of some sort damnation i started from my chair did mrs harmon hear the story not last night i'm certain elizabeth said the gardener told her as she came down to the chateau gates to meet me when i arrived it was late and louise had already gone to her room in fact i have not seen her yet but what difference could it possibly make whether she heard it or not she doesn't know these people surely she knows the man this insane he is not insane i interrupted he has lost the memory of his earlier life lost it through an accident you and i saw the accident that's impossible said george frowning i never saw but one accident that you that was the one the man is larrabee harman george had struck a match to light a cigar but the operation remained incomplete he dropped the match upon the floor and set his foot upon it well tell me about it he said you haven't heard anything about him since the accident only that he did eventually recover and was taken away from the hospital i heard that his mind was impaired does louise he began stopped and cleared his throat <clears> throat> has mrs harman heard that he is here yes she has seen him do you mean the scoundrel has been bothering her elizabeth didn't tell me of this your sister doesn't know i said lifting my hand to check him i think you ought to understand the whole case if you'll let me tell you what i know about it go ahead he bade me i'll try to listen patiently though the very thought of the fellow has always set my teeth on edge he's not at all what you think i said there's an enormous difference almost impossible to explain to you but something you'd understand at once if you saw him it's such a difference in fact that when i found that he was larrabee harman the revelation was inexpressibly shocking and distressing to me he came here under another name i had no suspicion that he was any one i'd ever heard of much less that i'd actually seen him twice two years ago and i've grown to well in truth to be fond of him what is the change asked ward and his voice showed that he was greatly disquieted what is he like as well as i can tell you he's like an odd but very engaging boy with something pathetic about him quite splendidly handsome oh he had good looks to spare when i first knew him george said bitterly i dare say he's got them back if he's taken care of himself or been taken care of rather but go on i won't interrupt you again why did he come here hoping to see no when he came here he did not know of her existence except in the vaguest way but to go back to that i'd better tell you first that the woman we saw with him one day on the boulevard and who was in the accident with him la murciana the dancer i know she had got him to go through a marriage with her what 
ward's eyes flashed as he shouted the word it seems inexplicable but as i understand it he was never quite sober at that time he had begun to use drugs and was often in a half stupefied condition as a matter of fact the woman did what she pleased with him there's no doubt about the validity of the marriage and what makes it so desperate a muddle is that since the marriage she's taken good care to give no grounds upon which a divorce could be obtained for harmon she means to hang on i'm glad of that said george striking his knee with his open palm that will go a great way toward he paused and asked suddenly did this marriage take place in france yes you'd better hear me through i remonstrated when he was taken from the hospital he was placed in charge of a professor keredec a madman of whom you've probably heard madman why no he's a member of the institute a psychologist or a metaphysician isn't he at any rate of considerable celebrity nevertheless i insisted grimly as misty a vaporer as i ever saw a poetic self-contradicting and inconsistent orator a blower of bubbles a seer of visions a mystic and a dreamer about as scientific as alice's white knight harman's aunt who lived in london the only relative he had left i believe and she has died since put him in keredec's charge and he was taken up into the tyrol and virtually hidden for two years the idea being literally to give him something like an education keredec's phrase is restore mind to his soul what must have been quite as vital was to get him out of his horrible wife's clutches and they did it for she could not find him but she picked up that rat in the garden out yonder he'd been some sort of stable manager for harman once and set him on the track he ran the poor boy down and yesterday she followed him now it amounts to a species of sordid siege she wants money of course yes more money a fair allowance has always been sent to her keredec has interviewed her notary and she wants a settlement naming a sum actually larger than the whole estate amounts to there were colossal expenditures and equally large shrinkages what he has left is invested in english securities and is not a fortune but of course she won't believe that and refuses to budge until this impossible settlement is made you can imagine about how confident such a man as keredec would be to deal with the situation in the meantime his ward is in so dreadful a state of horror and grief i am afraid it is possible that his mind may really give way for it was not in a normal condition of course though he's perfectly sane as i tell you if it should i concluded with some bitterness i suppose keredec will be still prating upliftingly on the saving of his soul when was it that louise saw him ah that i said is where keredec has been a poet and a dreamer indeed it was his plan that they should meet you mean he brought this wreck of harmon these husks and shreds of a man down here for louise to see ward cried incredulously oh monstrous no i answered only insane not because there is anything lacking in oliver in harmon i mean for i think that will be righted in time but because the second marriage makes it a useless cruelty that he should have been allowed to fall in love with his first wife again yet that was keredec's idea of a beautiful restoration as he calls it there is something behind all this that you don't know said ward slowly i'll tell you after i've seen this keredec when did this man make you his confidant last night most of what i learned was as much a revelation to his victim as it was to me harman did not know till then that the lady he had been meeting had been his wife or that he had ever seen her before he came here he had mistaken her name and she did not enlighten him meeting said ward harshly you speak as if they have been meeting every day george i won't believe it of her he cried she couldn't it's true he spoke to her in the woods one day i was there and saw it 
i now know that she knew him at once and she ran away but not in anger i shouldn't be a very good friend of yours i went on gently if i didn't give you the truth they've been together every day since then and i'm afraid miserably afraid ward that her old feeling for him has been revived i have heard ward use an oath only two or three times in my life and this was one of them oh by god he cried starting to his feet i should like to meet professor keredec i am at your service my dear sir said a deep voice from the veranda and opening the door the professor walked into the room End of chapter 18